John Einerson, the editor of Kyoto Journal, an English language magazine published in Japan, wrote me last summer and asked about a contribution to a special issue of the journal devoted to the theme of diversity. He, intended to, he intends to distribute a copy of that issue to each of the 15,000 delegates attending an international conference on biodiversity to be held this month in Kyoto. This is the piece I sent John. It's called 6,000 Lessons. When I was a boy, I wanted to see the world. Bit by bit, it happened. In 1948, at the age of three, I left my home in Mamaroneck, New York, just north of New York City, and flew with my mother to a different life in California's San Fernando Valley, outside Los Angeles. I spent my adolescent summers at the Grand Canyon and swam in the Great Pacific. Later, when my mother married again, we moved to the Murray Hill section of Manhattan, another sort of canyon. I traveled across Europe by bus when I was 17. I went to Mexico. In 1970, I moved to rural Oregon. I camped in the desert in Namibia and on the polar plateau 20 kilometers from the South Pole. I flew to Bangkok and Belém, to Nairobi and Perth, and traveled out into the country beyond. Over the years, I ate many unfamiliar meals, overheard arguments on town and city streets conducted in Pashto, Afrikaans, Cree, Flemish, Aranda, and other tongues unknown to me. I prayed in houses of worship not my own, walked through refugee camps in Lebanon, and crossed impossible mountain passes on the Silk Road. Witness was what I was after, not achievement. From the beginning, I wanted to understand how very different each stretch of landscape, each boulevard, each cultural aspiration was. The human epistemologies embedded in 6,000 spoken ways of knowing God compare with the 6,000 ways a river can plunge from high country to low, or the 6,000 ways dawn might break over the Atacama, the Tanami, the Gobi, the Sonora. Anyone determined to see so many of the world's disparate faces might easily succumb to the heresy of believing one place is finally not so different from another somewhere, because in the moment he is weary of variety or otherwise not paying attention. I have found myself there, but each place is itself only and nowhere repeated, miss it, and it's gone. Of the 6,000 valuable lessons that might be offered to a persistent traveler, here is one. Here's one I received. Over the years in speaking with Eskimo people, Yupik and Inupiaq in Alaska and Inuit in Canada, I've come to understand that they prefer to avoid the way we use collective nouns in the West to speak about a species. Their tendency is not to respond to a question about what it is that caribou do, but to say instead what an individual caribou once did in the particular set of circumstances, in that place, at that time of year, in those weather conditions, with these other animals around. It is important to understand, they say, that on another apparently similar occasion, the same animal might do something different. All caribou, despite their resemblance to each other, are not only differentiated one from the other, but are in the end unpredictable. In Xi'an once, where Chinese archeologists have uncovered a marching army of terracotta horses and soldiers, and where visitors could view them in long pits in situ, I studied several hundred of each with a pair of binoculars. The face of each one, men and horses alike, was unique, itself only. I've watched hundreds of impala bounding away from lions on the savanna of Botswana in Africa, and flocks of white corellas roosting at dusk in copses of gum trees at the edge of the great sandy desert in Western Australia. And I have had no doubt in those moments that with patience and tutoring, I would learn to distinguish one animal from another. 
it is terrifying for me to consider now how television, a kind of cultural nerve gas, has compromised the world's 6,000 epistemologies, generalizing them into the inutility of what we all know and what we all believe. To consider the campaigns mounted for all to speak Mandarin or English in order to make life easier. To consider how a stunning photograph of a phantom organ, orchid can be made to stand today for all phantom orchids through time. To consider how traveling to Vienna can signify for some that you've more or less been to Prague. How, if you're pressed for time, one thing can justifiably take the place of another. During these years of travel, my understanding of what diversity means has changed. I began with an intuition that the world was, from place to place and from culture to culture, far more different than I had been led to believe. Later, I began to understand that to ignore these differences was not simply insensitive, but unjust and perilous. To ignore the difference does not make things better. It creates isolation, pain, fury, despair. Finally, I came to see something profound. Long-term, healthy patterns of social organization among all social life forms, it seemed to me, hinged on work that maintained the integrity of the community while at the same time granting autonomy to its individuals. What made a society beautiful and memorable was some combination of autonomy and deference that together minimize strife. It is now my understanding that diversity is not, as I had once thought, a characteristic of life. It is instead a condition necessary for life. To eliminate diversity would be like eliminating carbon and expecting life to go on. This, I believe, is why even a passing acquaintance with endangered languages or endangered species or endangered cultural traditions brings with it so much anxiety, so much sadness. We know in our tissues that the fewer the differences we encounter in our travels, the more widespread the kingdom of death has become. A few weeks ago, a few weeks ago I was walking in the woods behind my house, about 40 miles up the Mackenzie River from here, with my grandson Owen was seven. He was a few steps behind me when I saw a feather from the breast of a raptor, possibly a red-tailed hawk, suspended amid the leaves of a thimbleberry bush. I gave it to Owen and told him the feather was the beginning of a mystery that we might soon learn more about. And we did. We came on another breast feather and then another, and as I saw them here and there in the brush and let him find them, until he had 11 small feathers pinched between his fingers. I wondered what had happened to the bird. A string of feathers lined out for a 100 feet along a path beneath the closed canopy of the forest. I was puzzling over it, trying to figure it out when Owen said, look, Grandpa. I turned around and saw he was holding up a primary feather longer than his forearm. His eyes were half shut wonder and glee. The crown jewel, he said. I saw what he meant, but I also saw him, a boy with dreams, himself a crown jewel. What one day would be the scope of his imagination? What would be the range of possibilities open to him? Would they be anything like what the world had given my generation? I want to work with people who think about people like Owen. I want to be understood as someone who is a member of a family, a member of a community, to be understood as someone with skills to complement those of others in the community, and with a job to do that has been done by others before me and will be done better by people after me, which is not to let a certain set of ideas about justice and reverence and courage and compassion and grace if they bear fruit in my lifetime, wonderful. If they do not, it is no matter, as long as I do my part to ensure their survival. Among the things now 
urgently required of us in public and private life, it seems to me, are a profound courtesy toward each other. A conversation about how reconciliation might replace war. The war in the self, the war in the family kitchen, the war in the streets of places like Mogadishu. And an effort to understand and promote the evolution in our society of an ethical imagination. We're capable of these things, and they are worth our time, and we require each other to do them. We do not require geniuses and heroes. We require each other. Peter, thank you for everything you've done. Please call on us. Good luck on November 2nd, and thank you all for coming this evening.